So we're talking about uh, blessings and we're talking about success. And that, I know that means different things to different people. First of all, some people have the misguided idea that a blessing is uh, something that involves money. And while it can, it's the blessing is a much greater concept and, and much greater value than just dollars and cents. Because there's some things that you can't place a price on, and we talk about this often. You can't place a price on good health. If you're sick, what would you, I mean, if you're really, really sick, seriously ill, what would you give if you could be completely well and made whole again? And you say, well, there's not enough money in the world. I'd give you all that there is if I had it. Freedom is something that is, is uh, beyond price. And love, what about love? I mean, there's just... True love is something that is just, and then God's love, being a recipient of God's love, God's grace and God's mercy. These are blessings that are beyond price. And when it comes to success, uh, success can be thought of in, in a worldly and material way, uh, in, a, in a materialistic way, or it can be thought of in a way in which godly Christian people consider what true success really is. And so, Obviously, don't hear me doing, a, don't hear me uh, 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 delivering a, like a quick, uh, get rich quick uh, a sermon that has to do about, about uh, filling your pockets with more money and all this. And uh, I, that's not what this is about. This is actually the last part of a series that I started, well, back before the end of the year, which has to do with uh, good stewardship and good money management as taught in the Bible. These are biblical principles. And so, um, here are some introductory thoughts that I jotted down. The world belongs to the energetic. That was said by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, your ship will never come in unless you sent one out. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Real success is measured in how we use our success. In other words, it's not a big deal to, um, to work steady, that is if you're healthy, if you can get a job to work steady and save a good portion of that money and just always just keep saving, you don't have to be uh, extra smart. You don't have to be extra virtuous to do that. Uh, anybody who chooses to just, you know, just, just live on less than they make and save and invest it wisely. Uh, but then true success is not just winding up with, uh, a, a, you know, a pile of money one of these days. It's how we use that blessing or that success, and if we do it to the glory of God. And the final thought in my introductory uh, uh, episode or, or part this evening is this. God can separate anyone from financial success, okay? Now, somebody says, but I thought God was going to make me rich. No, he never promised that. He did promise to bless you, and he promised to prosper you, but, uh, but the, when the Bible talks about prosperity... It's not necessarily all about wealth because prosperity has to do with, uh, with good health and, 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 uh, and friendships and family and, and freedom and so many things are involved in prosperity. But now, if God sees the need to separate anybody from their wealth, he can do it. He can do it in, in at least two ways. Number one is by death. And we're going to look at an episode this, uh, this evening from Luke chapter 12 about the rich man who said, I finally got it made. I've got everything I need and now I can relax and take it easy. And God says, but just one thing you forgot to think about. Tonight, you're going to die. And so you can be separated from wealth that way. Another way is when God allows us to go bankrupt. And some amazing, brilliant Hardworking people have gone bankrupt uh, in, in this life and in this world. And Job, of all people, in Job chapter 1, verse 22, winds up not only losing his health and not only losing his family, but he lost his wealth. He lost everything. He went completely bankrupt. And God let that happen. Now, we know the end of that story, and we know that if you just continue to read the book of Job, that Job winds up with his wealth restored even more than he lost. But, but he was allowed to go bankrupt. And so God can separate us from our money, especially if we are depending too much on it and trusting too much in it. So let's talk about this business of being blessed for success. This is Psalm 118, verse 25, where the psalmist says, Lord, save us and grant us success. 
Now, obviously, the psalmist is not talking about some kind of shallow success. He's not talking about being a Hollywood starlet or um, someone who has uh, uh, won the lottery or something like that. But he's talking about success in the most wholesome uh, uh, sense possible. Proverbs 2, 7. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. Then Proverbs eleven twenty eight: Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. And so there he's talking about the difference between real success and the kind of success that can... Um, well, that we can lose. And so blessings, it's important for us to realize, true blessings, the kind of blessings that are priceless, come from God. And even if we prosper financially, we must always remember that this comes from God. This next verse I'm going to share with you, I, I, it's just like it was yesterday. I remember the day that Jimmy Barnett pointed this verse out to me. I was a, uh, a greenhorn, ignorant uh, Bible student, Bible college student, but I had managed to blunder around and get a, a job, a full-time preaching job at the Rogersville Church of Christ. And I knew that they knew that I didn't know very much. I was still in the process of trying to learn a few things, you know. And so I've got this auditorium class, an uh, adult class, some mature people. Jimmy Barnett was uh, a farmer. And he was a, um, uh, you, you might say, a successful farmer. Not in a big, big time way, but he, he, he did all right. He lived well. Had a lot of land and, uh, and managed it. And he was a very serious-minded uh, person as far as his business was concerned. Jimmy Barnett has fed, and he, and he and his family, a lot of people because they have grown all kinds of food, both the cattle and, and, uh, and, and crops and things like that. But I had this class one Sunday morning, and I'd probably been there about three or four months. And I was in over my head, but I knew it. You see, it's all right to know if, if you know you're in over your head, that's, that's not as bad as thinking you know it all and you really are, you don't know it all. And so I was trying to talk about this business of how that we need to thank God even when we do the right thing and we pay our bills and we work hard and we manage our money well and we tend to do better than the average person does. And Jimmy raises his hand. He, ne he never spoke in, in class. Never. This was the first. So I almost had a heart attack when he raised his hand because I'm thinking, what's he going to say? I've never heard him say anything. He said, uh, Brother Dennis, um, turn to Deuteronomy chapter. And he read, he, this was Deuteronomy 8, 18. Are you ready? And there's, this is the verse. He wanted me to read to the class. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. And so that verse, that, that, I'll never forget that verse, never forget that day, never forget Jimmy, and because he, here's a man who, he didn't talk much, but man, he lived the life. I'm talking about he lived the life of a righteous man. He was, a, he was the, the best of neighbors. He was, the, he was a praying man. He was a kind man. He was a gentle man. He was a godly man. And when a man like that asks you to read a particular verse, and the verse is to remind you that you didn't get successful by yourself. You got successful if God allowed you to be successful. It is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And then there's that passage in Luke chapter 12 that I mentioned. This is, uh, of course, the guy who thinks that he can depend upon his, uh, his money and his farm and his riches and all that. And so Jesus tells them a parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. By the way, one thing I want to point out here is that even if you are a person who... Uh, who lives the abundant life I'm talking about as far as finances are concerned there's certain things you got to do and one of the things you got to do is you've got to put the seed in the ground in other words you've got to clear the land you've got to till the soil and you've got to put the seed in the ground but you can't make that seed produce you just can't that that power comes from God God has of course uh, infused the seed with his life with life that causes uh, that, that the seed to decay but then the germ of life is there and it shoots that little plant up and it produces more fruit but, uh, but, uh, but the, this guy at least knew that he had to put seed in the ground 
and his harvest was abundant. Verse 17. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life or your soul will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with those who store up things for themselves, but are not rich toward God. And so it's very important for us to realize that if we don't keep God in our lives, then he can separate us from our wealth and nothing can come of it because we have forgotten to honor God with the wealth that he allowed us to handle for a little while. Now the scripture says that God blesses honest people. There's an old saying, by hook or crook is not by the book. In other words, the Bible does not talk about and teach us to just get money any way you possibly can. By hook or crook is not by the book. But honesty is God's way. This is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11 and following. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely. By my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. In other words, if he's worked an honest day, then, then pay him and don't, don't delay paying him. And so he's just, he's just, these are just principles in which God says, I can bless you if you're willing to be an upright person. If you're willing to shoot straight and tell the truth. And not take advantage of people just because you can. And then God blesses hard work. Somebody said that prosperity has a price tag. And only those willing uh, to pay it can, 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 can have it, can have prosperity. Winners go the extra mile. They go farther. Uh, they work longer. They work harder. And they do more than the average person. And so the scripture says that God will bless hard work. Lazy hands, Proverbs 10, 4, make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And, and don't let me, um, don't let me uh, make you think that, that um, you have to be wealthy by the world's standards in order for uh, me to be teaching what the Bible, that that's what the Bible is teaching. Forget about the world's standards. Wealthy is anything when you have more than you need. That's what wealthiness is. That's what being rich is, having more than you need. It's when you've got not only just enough food, but you've got more food. It's where you, you, have, uh, you have more than uh, threadbare clothing and one, one, one uh, outfit. It's where you have uh, um, adequate room and shelter and safety and things like that. That's what it means to be wealthy. Proverbs 13.4. A sluggard's appetite, that means a lazy person, a, a, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Matthew 13, 3 and 4. And the reason I bring this up, and I'm not going to read the entire parable of the sower, uh, just maybe the first verse, the first three there. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now the principle there is, is that we are participants in God's process of blessing us. The farmer, and of course the, it goes on to say that he sowed seed on the four kinds of soil, and one of those soil uh, was fertile, one of those kinds of soil. But the important thing to realize is that we've got to sow the seed. In other words, we've got to be willing to do the work. We've got to be willing to show up on the job and be there on time and give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay and things like that. And so the sower went out to sow his seed. And then it's very important for us to realize that God blesses sound judgment. And you know what sound judgment is, don't you? Sound judgment is just the opposite of bad judgment or foolish judgment. And so most, I think anybody knows what sound judgment is. Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. 
They think about what they're doing. Uh, my sister uh, has five children. They're just about all grown now. But uh, one of the ways she would discipline them when they were little was she would say, go over there and stand in that corner and think about it. Well, her oldest, Taylor, when she was up about five, uh, she said to her little sister, Bailey, when, who was about three, she, it's one day when Bailey did something she shouldn't have, and little Taylor said, go over in that corner and think about it. Because she learned that that's what wise people do. You think about, your, you know, what you, you think about what you've, you've done or you didn't do or what you should have done or what you did wrong or something like that. Heard a man interviewed a few days ago who had spent, he was falsely accused and was in prison for a number of years. And this happens, we see it on the news all the time. This happens. Um, but he said, one of the things about being in prison is that you have a lot of time to think. He says, you can review your life. He said, you can even remember conversations that you, you know, you otherwise would have forgotten. And you can remember what you said and what was said to you. And you can, you can just review it all again. And he says, you, you can, you'll find time to think about, there's where I went wrong. Or that's what I should have done. Or that was one thing that I did well. But he said, you can just review your life um, when you're in prison because you have this opportunity to think. Well, God blesses sound judgment. These are people, people with sound judgment are people who think about what they're doing. He even talks about how that adversaries, in other words, enemies of God, in this case, it's enemies of Israel, if they would just think about what they're doing, they wouldn't do what they're doing. So he says this, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, 29, if only, these are the enemies of Israel, they were wise and would understand this and discern what their end will be. In other words, if they would just think about how this is going to turn out when you resist God and you rebel against God and you neglect to do what God uh, commands you to do, or in this case, you fail to refrain from doing something that God would not have you to do. So God will bless sound judgment, but people who don't use sound judgment are going to get their, themselves in trouble. God blesses good management. Now, what is good management? We were talking about management of... Uh, of uh, of life and, and so forth. Alan and I re ate in a restaurant um, back some time ago, uh, the Italian restaurant, the, the Riccatoni's. Well, uh, that guy and his brother, who is a musician, uh, I'm talking about not the owner, but the, the, the manager of this restaurant. They went to the river last Wednesday, got in a boat, and never, they went to go fishing, and they never came back, and they've still not been found. Their boat was found capsized and wedged under, the, uh, under a bridge, um, but they've not been found yet. And so they were interviewing, and the newspaper was telling, they were interviewing the owner of the restaurant, and he was talking about what a fantastic manager this missing young man was, how he'd been his manager for years, and how that he didn't know what he was going to do without, uh, without this manager, because he... This young man made that business successful because he was a good manager. Well, God values good management. And so he says this. He says, look at things like the ants that I've made. This is Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. Go to the ant, you lazy person. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And so he's just saying, if you'll pay attention to something as simple as a tiny little ant, that ant can teach you some amazing lessons about management and good planning and things like that. God blesses courage and he blesses faith. Now, let me share with you, I just threw down some things that just, you know, occurred off the top of my head. Let me share with you some loser language. In other words, just the opposite of being courageous and full of faith. Loser language goes something like this. You can't do that, or I can't do that. There's no use in even trying. It's too hard. It's too difficult. Uh, if it's such a great idea, everybody would be doing it. Or if you... If you play it safe and don't take any risk, then you'll never fail. That's loser language there. See, it's all right to fail. It's all right, it's all right to try 
and fail because you learn a lot which makes you able to make better decisions the next time you approach something the next time you want to embrace some new adventure uh, once poor always poor that's uh, unfortunately that's how a lot of people think I, I, grew, I, was, I was born into a poor family and I guess I'll just have to die uh, in my own poor family because there's nothing I can do about my situation that's loser language and of course Christians God's people need to reject that kind of language and self-talk and thought God blesses courage and he blesses faith this is Joshua chapter 1 and this I love this language let's look at it this is where Joshua was given the charge to lead Israel forward and so this is what God is saying to him verse 6 be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them verse 7 be strong and very courageous you see he just said strong and courageous and the first time but then he said be strong and very courageous be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you do not turn from it to the right or to the left in other words stay on the true path uh, that you may be successful wherever you go keep this book of the law always on your lips meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful have I not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be afraid do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go and then let's listen to the to the man who reached a, a good age of maturity and I really do hope I get to live as long as old Caleb did and and even longer uh, Lord willing this is uh, uh, Joshua chapter 14, and we're looking at verses 6 through 12. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, Caleb son of Jephunneh, the Kenziite, said to them, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites went up with me and made the hearts of the people melt. In other words, they came back talking loser language. They came back talking like the, the people there are too big. And this is an amazing land, but we're like ants in their sight. And, you know, or grasshoppers, he said, in, in, in their sight. And there's no use in even trying to take the land because it's just impossible. That was the loser language. But not Caleb and not Joshua. These men said, we can do it. We can do it because God is with us. And if God is with us, then all we need to do is be strong and courageous and go forth. But he says this, verse 9. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. I love that word right there. Wholeheartedly or with all your heart. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, he says, 85 years old and I'm ready, 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 ready. He said, I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go into battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country. Give me this mountain that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, he said. There's a man with courage and faith. His faith is in the Lord and he's courageous because he says the Lord will be with me and will help me be successful. And so the Lord blesses those who are courageous and who are filled with faith and I just I want to call on all of us tonight to be filled with good courage and faith. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in the Lord and, and, and attempt great things and believe, believe, believe. Even if it doesn't work out, we'll always be better off if we try to do something great in our lives. Amen? And so that's what it means to be blessed for success. The plan of salvation is on the screen. And we would encourage anyone who has not yet obeyed the gospel to choose to do so tonight. That's the first step in being blessed. That's the first step in being successful. 
And now if you're already a Christian, but you uh, need the prayers of the church, you'll never find a better time than right now to ask your church family to pray with you and for you. Why? Because there's a great day coming and we need to be ready for it. Won't you come now while together we're standing and singing.